Well, good morning, everybody, fellow PhD students, um, the few undergraduates that are among us, the CDT directors. Um, for me, it's a pleasure to introduce one of the nice and dearest minds in, that is in this university. Sir Peter Knight is a senior research investigator in the physics department at Imperial College and principal of, uh, of the Cavalier Royal Society International Center. His research centers on the theoretical quantum optics, strong field physics, and especially on quantum information science. And furthermore, Peter Knight is a past member of the Optical Society of America. Um, he was knighted in 2005, and well, he has won a really amazing number of prizes um, that probably he won't let me say it because he's very humble. But <laughs> due to his vast experience, in the field, uh, he gladly accepted uh, to provide us a better insight uh, on this emerging field of the quantum technologies. So without further ado, I will, he will talk about quants, quantum physics, and the flash crash. So please welcome Sir Peter Knight. Before I do that, let me just echo what Adrian said. Um, having been CSA and uh, a chair of a science advisory council for various bits of government, I can tell you that the DFE isn't the only evidence-free zone in Whitehall. Um, but it's still worth doing because I believe that um, we have many challenges, global challenges, that we have to meet where scientific advice is absolutely essential. Um, otherwise, we're just judging things in terms of prejudices uh, and misinformation. Okay, so that's my title. Um, I've arranged the pictures, uh, having retired from Imperial, sort of, um, I've arranged the pictures in, in diminishing order of aesthetic value. Um, so the one on the left is, is the Cavley Institute, the one in the middle is the Institute of Physics, where I'm president, and that's the, the view of my office over in Huxley. Okay, so what am I gonna tell you about? Um, well, the first thing to do is to tell you about the flash crash. Then I'm going to move on to ways in which quantum technology um, plays a role in these kinds of things. If I have time, um, I need to tell you how washing makes you heavier. Okay? So they're the various things that I'm going to tell you about. Right, let's start with the flash crash. Okay? Um, one of the things that quants do is that they devise algorithms to make money, um, often with tiny margins, but with a tremendous frequency. And one of the big changes that's happened is automatic trading. Algorithmically generated trades on the stock market, which take place without human intervention, other than the design of the algorithm. Um, so about a third of the, uh, the trades on, on the UK stock market at the moment, and more than half in the US, um, are these high-frequency trades. And by high-frequency trades, I mean trades that are executed in less than a microsecond. So there's no latency. There is no human intervention. Now, what did it do? Well, it, clearly, it makes you lots of money if you can get in ahead of other people. And that, so speed is of the essence, but it has consequences. And this is one of the consequences. Um, on the 6th of May 2010, there was what's called the flash crash. And the flash crash eliminated, fortunately temporarily, 650 billion pounds from the value of the New York stock market. Okay? It took place very rapidly. Whoa, don't want that. Want that. It took place very rapidly. Um, it did not... This is ours down here. Okay? And it was a bigger crash than anything we've seen since the 1929 failure of the stock market in New York. Okay? It was triggered principally by, by a 4.1 billion automated sale. Then all the other algorithms were feeding off that big sale and trading like crazy. Okay? Then, then of course, you saw this tremendous drop. Okay? The Dow dropped by nearly 10%. It did bounce back, but it didn't bounce back to entirely the same position. Basically, about $70 billion was, was, was removed from the value of... Um, of basically of gilts and equity funds. Okay, so you see this tremendous crash and it led to a feeling 
that the, the, the trading situation was, was pretty much out of control. Um, so this report uh, was, was a committee that John Beddington chaired, and, and I had a role in as well, looking at ways in which you might want to do something about this. I'll get a little example of some of the share prices. Accenture fell, its it, it stock fell from 40 bucks to a cent. It's crazy. So, lots of things that you would want to be able to do on this. Um, politicians will say immediately, well, we'll ban automatic trading. Well, that's incredibly naive. You could try building latency. That's incredibly naive. Because clearly the fastest way you can trade, the more chance you have of making a profit. So what you could think of instead is to say, these automatic trades will happen. No matter what you do, these are going to continue and will actually dominate the markets. So what you need to be able to do is to assign credit and blame for each part of the trading cycle. Now to get assignation of credit, who did what in what order is really important. For a sub-microsecond trade, you would need nanosecond accuracy in the time stamping of all of the component parts within the network. Okay, now you can see where I'm coming from now. Quantum technology gives you the ability to provide that, that time stamping. Okay, so let's see what we can do in this sort of area. Well, just back off a little bit and tell you about quantum enabled technology. There have been two quantum revolutions um, in, in the last hundred years. The first one, following the, the development of the theory of quantum mechanics, led to transistors, lasers, all sorts of things. These were all based on the fact that energy levels are quantized. It transformed the world by more than anything we've seen since the Industrial Revolution. And it's actually something which we should be really proud of. The fact, for example, that these erbium dope fiber amplifiers were developed principally in the UK is what actually generates broadband. These things are quantum limited. They give you the ability to trade, to entertain, to do all the things we now take for granted. It's transformed business. It's transformed entertainment. That's the first one. The second quantum revolution, which is what we're in the middle of, exploits coherence. The ability to make these funny quantum superpositions where you're in a superposition of more than you know, one state and another state in a coherent way. So what I'm going to tell you about are the ways in which that, that, that works. Coherence is exploited in things that you use every day. In particular, your smartphones have geolocation built into them. Geolocation depends upon atomic clocks. And I'm going to tell you quite a lot about atomic clocks. So that's the first atomic clock. Whoops, I keep doing that. Sorry about that. That's the first atomic clock. This is Essen and Parry at the National Physical Laboratory um, who built the first ever atomic clock. And it, it led to the redefinition of what the second is. Okay, clearly you had to wear a suit and tie to work at NPL in the 1950s. Um, but it's not the only thing you use it for. Um, you, you, we use quantum coherence in magnetic resonance imaging. I, I have to call it MRI. I think it's really weasel words that we've missed the N word of nuclear magnetic resonance, but never mind, we lost that one, I think. Um, okay, but also in secure communication, which I really won't speak about today. Okay, so. Well, we live in a pretty networked world, but we have done for a long time, and, and I quite like this slide. This is from the Eastern Telegraph Company in 1901, demonstrating how the world was interconnected more than 100 years ago. And you can see the copper cables that link up the United States via the UK, if we, if we look down there through the Red Sea and the rest, and optical fibers which replace this pretty much at the moment track it exactly the same place. Okay, so optical fibers that replace that copper cable go in pretty much in the same way. If we, if we, <coughs> if we could predict a, a map for what it will look like in 20 years' time, there'll be much more over here. I mean, basically, the communications networks are going to go east. Okay, so we've been networked for a long time. 
And it's through that networking that enables to do that automatic trade that we talked about. Because you can sit in New York trading, but the trades could be actually executed anywhere in the world because of these fast communication networks. Right, so atomic clocks, where did they come from? Well, they started with this character. This is Isidore Rabi. Uh, Rabi was one of the great figures of, of 20th century physics. Uh, working at Columbia, he'd worked out that what you can do is to, is to build a magnetic resonance machine with exquisite precision. So what he did is he decided that he could study atoms and molecules without the complication of motion. So we'd use an atomic beam and interact with them so you remove the, the Doppler width, the, the smearing out of energy levels that motion causes. Okay. Um, he had a state selection and a state analysis using the deflection of, of, of atoms magnetically by magnets, of course, stone gullet magnets. And then you drive this spin system. There's a spin. Let's get it to process, shall we? Yeah, there you go. So you get this thing processing, and you flip that spin into a superposition with radio frequency fields. And that gives you incredibly narrow resonance signals. Those incredibly narrow resonance signals give you the ability um, to work out what's going on spectroscopically with atoms, molecules, and so on. OK. Now, one of Rabi's students was Norman Ramsey, who died last year. Um, and Norman showed how you could get even narrower lines using interference, quantum interference. So what Ramsey did is he said, right, we'll take the Rabi beam machine idea, an oven, atoms or molecules would diffuse out the oven, you'd have a collimating slit, and the atoms would fly through the vacuum apparatus to a detector. There's some magnets over here which will deflect the atoms in a way that depends on the state. There's a magnet over here that will deflect them again, depending on the state. So that's a, that prepares the atomic state, that analyzes it. And in the middle, you'd have this region where the radio frequency field comes in and flips the spins. Okay, but what you do is to have two regions of RF field, one there, one there. Oh, damn. Okay, one there, one there. And, and so basically you have a, an amplitude for being excited in this first cavity, just there, an amplitude over there, and you get basically interference fringes, which are even narrower. <coughs> that then gave you the most exquisite precision. A while ago, I was in Munich, and Ramsey and I shared a lift from Munich Airport to the Max Planck in the, one of the Max Planck cars, which was one of the very first to have sat-nav built into it. You know, neither Norman nor I had ever seen Satnav before, but it was, in a, it was in a Max Planck car. And Norman stared at this thing and said, depends on atomic clocks. He thought about it a little longer and he said, do I get any royalties? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see how this atomic clock idea works now. Okay, so as I said, Essen and Parry wearing their suits. There's a bigger picture of them wearing their suits. That's the first atomic clock. It's so a cesium beam standard. If you want to see that, it's in the Science Museum next door. Okay, so cesium, hyperfine levels. This Ramsey idea of separated fields. And, the, and what it produced was incredibly narrow lines that were incredibly stable. Metrologists are very cautious people. And over about a 10-year period, it, it enabled them to redefine the second. Okay, so that's the first quantum standard. How about progress since then? Well, one of the problems to get a narrower and narrower line is the machine got longer and longer and longer. Because to get very narrow lines in frequency space, you need very long observation times. That's Fourier theorem. OK. So you could use slow atoms. And Gerald Zacharias tried that at MIT. And it was a sort of thought that was ahead of its time. And he built a beam machine that went up the uh, uh, the, the, the stairwell at MIT, and what he thought he'd do is to have a resonance region right at the top of the stairwell where these slow atoms coming up like a fountain turn over and come back down again. Okay, so we used the really slow ones right at the top. Okay, saw no signal, because the proportion of the velocity distribution in the beam that's really slow is about zero. 
Okay? But I, I did see the fountain machine because it still went up the stairwell when I went to visit uh, at the end of the 60s. But as soon as you have the ability to laser cool atoms and slow atoms down using lasers, the Zacharias idea was reinvented. So what you have, oh, I keep doing that. What you have is atomic beam, flies up through a radio frequency cavity, flies down again. Okay, and the ability to throw these very cold atoms depends on this ability to cool them and that particular one is called a magneto-optical trap, which cools these atoms down, and it throws them up as a cold ball of atoms. It, uh, and that's now the standard of time. Okay, so um, this is a fountain clock, ball of cold atoms, thrown up through the radio frequency region, back down again, two-slit interference from the amplitude for being excited on the way up, and then the amplitude for on the way down again. You cool them to about a microkelvin. They've got a velocity of around seven millimeters a second. And there's the definition now, the legal definition of the second. It's incredibly boring, but it's true that the, that, that now defines the second. Okay. Right. And so that's the world's most accurate atomic clock currently. Um, in case there are any molecular people around, this isn't based on cesium fluoride, even, even with two fluorines. This is the cesium fountain 2 clock, okay? Uh, and this is now the most accurate clock, and it's, it's pretty chunky. Cold atoms, RF region, and it's accurate to a part in 10 to the 16. That's the primary standard. That's what tells you what the second is. So if you ever tune into what we still call the rugby clock pips on the radio, it's linked to this thing. Actually, it's linked to secondary ones, but we won't go into detail on that one. Okay, so that's the clock. Okay, once you've got these clocks, what can you do with them? Well, I've already told you. You can start thinking in terms of geolocation because of timing. Okay, this is a very American-centric picture over on this corner. All of these are clocks built by what was the National Bureau of Standards that then got renamed as NIST. And the accuracy gets better and better and better and better. That dashed line there is when you start to use laser cooling to slow atoms down. Okay, and there's the NIST fountain clock. So there's the SN1. And what can you do with these? You can make fairly compact atomic secondary clocks that talk then to the primary standard for calibration. You can, you can then, then use these in terms of navigation. And that's how GPS works. So if you sit just here somewhere on the Earth's surface and you've got these satellites, the satellites whiz around, your GPS receiver will tell you how many satellites you can, you can see. And as soon as you can start to see satellites, which are calibrated with atomic time, you, you can start to, to build uh, location. Now, it's not the end of the story, because if I want to make even better clocks, I could do a number of things. Okay. There's a quality factor, Q, which gives you the resolution, basically, and it's the frequency divided by the, the spread in frequencies. Okay? So if we could keep the observation time, which governs one over the spread of frequencies, as long as possible, and get the frequency up, we could make even better clocks. And to do that means going to visible wavelengths or ultraviolet wavelengths for new instead of microwaves. And to trap atoms for a really long time so that T goes up. And that's exactly what you do in an iron trap where you hold them still for a very long time, okay, and you cool them, that's to hold them down. So a mercury clock has a fractional accuracy which is better than the primary standard. Strontium clocks are around ytterbium Euterbium ions have an octopole transition with a lifetime of 10 years. So one of our, P well, one of Richard Thompson's PhD students in our group worked on the observation of that octopole transition with a 10-year lifetime. Uh, and Matt had extremely long hair, and he said, if I find this wretched thing, real needle in the haystack, I'm going to shave all my hair off. And on Monday morning, he was walking up and down the Blackett Lab, shaking hands with people, completely bold. It was a tour de force that you saw it, and that may be the next one of these clocks. 
Okay, we need to make sure there are no systematics before we adopt it. But that was done here at Imperial, working with the National Physical Laboratory. Okay, so you can make these clocks. How does GPS actually work? Well, what a satellite does is that it emits a, a funny pulse train like so. Um, it's funny because you want to tell one satellite from another. Okay, so it's a digital code so that you can actually tell one from another. All the GPS sa satellites are then time synchronized with each other, uh, okay, so that you actually know when the signal's transmitted. Your GPS receiver also is time stamped and it knows when it received it. And so it doesn't take very much arithmetic to know how far away the satellite is. And then if you can do that with three satellites, you get geopositioning. Okay? Right. So, I've removed some of the labels off this because I don't want any of you to go to jail. Okay? Um, can, you, can you see what this is from the back? Yeah? Is it, okay. So this is the UK. Is, is Bob May in the audience? Oh, thank God for that. Good. Okay, I'll keep going. This is incredibly congested shipping channel. That's the English Channel. Okay, there's a ship just there, which is one of ours. Okay, does anybody know what this is? Anybody that's not heard me give this talk before, or have heard this talk? Okay, this is thoroughly illegal. That's a GPS jammer. It's a big one. It's got a, quite a long range. You operate one of those things, we send you to jail. Okay? Well, we bought one of those. <laughs> okay? And what we did is that we installed it near Gosport, and we persuaded, now I've got to find the ship. That one there, which is one of ours, um, that, that it was nowhere near what GPS was telling it it was. Okay? We actually moved its position by hundreds of miles. Okay? So that's a jammer that's got a long range. There are little jammers about that big, thoroughly illegal, which go in the cigar lighter of your car. Last week, nine of them were seized from outside Canary Wharf. Okay? What they were used for was dis to disrupt entirely the, the time stamping sequence in Canary Wharf for a, a rights issue. Okay? So you can't timestamp. You don't know when any trades happen. Okay? They're thoroughly illegal. So that's hardware jamming of GPS. This is even worse. This is software jamming of GPS. I've no idea what possessed these guys at uh, Carnegie Mellon to publish this. <laughs> I have a feeling I know where they might be now. This is a software attack. And this software attack was capable of bringing down between 20 and 30% of the entire global GPS system. Okay. If you ever see these, these words, oh, it's not on that one, that's good. If you see GNNS, it's, it, 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 it is satellite-enabled communication. It's a GPS in a different language. So there are hardware attacks, there are software attacks, and they're becoming really prevalent. One of the reasons you might want to buy one of these little cigar lighter ones is that you can use them as jammers uh, for some of the speed camera systems that are being used in Europe now. They're still illegal. Okay. All right. So, let's go back and think what we can do. If GPS comes down, if global positioning systems don't work anymore, geolocation doesn't work anymore temporarily, you need a flywheel. You need to be able to run your time independently of everybody else, accurately, during the outage time. Okay, so we need to be able to deliver compact atomic clocks which are portable, can, can slot into networks, routers, and so on. Okay, that's what I'm going to talk about next. So there's the primary beam standard. It costs a million bucks. It takes a kilowatt of power. It's enormous. It loses a second in 100 million years. There's a wristwatch. It costs 10 cents, the crystal, um, and so on. And what I'm going to be talking about is these things in the middle. These are compact atomic clocks. Okay. Right, so some history. A little techie for the physicists will get it. 
Okay. What I'm going to do, I've got an atomic ground state down there. There's an excited state. I'm going to use laser excitation to get me from one to two. And having got to this excited state, I'll remove that population. And it's quite an interesting way of doing state-selective examination of species. Okay? But of course, you might have another ground state down there. Most atoms have more than one ground state. There's a lot of stuff around that's nearly degenerate. So I've removed all the population that was in there, but the other half of the population was in there. Let's put another laser on to get up there. Okay, and when you do that, you discover you still only get half the population. It's one of Murphy's laws. You only got half the population. When that laser was on, put the other laser on to empty the other state. And you still only get half. And the reason is that you form a coherent superposition again of those two ground states. And that coherent superposition has no dipole moment. It can't be excited. Sometimes that's called coherent population trapping. It's something that I worried about a lot, as you can tell from this stuff. So we published all of this stuff. Okay, there are other ways of doing this. Okay, there's our publication saying it would be, it has important implications for frequency and clock standards. The other way of doing it is to patent it. And that's what these guys did, principally from the Lincoln Lab. I've never heard of any of them, by the way. And they did it years after our paper. OK, that's the basis of this new generation of atomic clocks. And the reason that it, it makes the ability to build compact atomic clocks is you can get rid of the microwave cavity. OK, we're building a clock, but we don't want one of these socking great microwave cavities in the way. So what we do instead is to take a laser and modulate it. You modulate it at the clock frequency. When you modulate the laser, it shoves sidebands out onto the light. So you imagine a situation where you go up and down by the two sidebands. So there's no RF involved at all, just the modulation of the laser. And as soon as you do that, you can get these incredibly narrow lines that, that I'd predicted back in the 70s. In fact, it has an ancient history as well. So there's no microwave cavity, very narrow lines. The other thing you do by modulating the laser is that it's got the same laser fluctuations. Laser fluctuations tend to destroy coherence, but in this particular transition, you go up with one field, down with another. They've got their phase locked. It's like having a stochastic windscreen washer that's doing this, but the difference between the two is fixed. OK, so you get really narrow lines. And what John Kitchen and Leo Holberg at NIST did is to start building these compact chip scale atomic clocks. So here they are. At the, oh, okay. Back, back, there we go. Semiconductor laser, a Vixel, polarizing optics, a little tiny cell with the cesium, the alkali atoms in it, a detector, feedback electronics to stabilize it, and you get these very narrow lines. So that's the prototype from, about, uh, from several years ago. And after about a decade of DARPA funding, it turned into a commercial device made by Symmetricom. There's the little alkali cell. That's not the world's largest penny, it's a standard so it's down the center. And you can commercialize these things. And you can buy them from a number of places. They're compact. They take very little power. They can fit into a rack. OK, so let's show you one from Kronos, which is a British company, OK, which then goes into comm systems. And it's very compact. And it means that if GPS comes down, you can flywheel. Not only that, you can also time stamp on these things. At the heart of it is this chip scale atomic clock from Symmetricom in the US. And the danger is that this would be ITAR restricted. And what ITAR means is that the United States would put an, ex an export ban on these. And so if the rest of the world is, becomes wholly dependent on these kinds of synchronization techniques, we have to develop a, a, our own capability, which is why in the UK we're having a big push at the moment on these compact chip scale atomic clocks. OK, so go back to this micro-trading and the flash crash that I started with. What we should be able to do with compact clocks is to produce time stamping, because the compact clocks have a fractional accuracy that's much better than the part in 10 to the 10, probably approaching 10 to the 12 uh, by the time we've finished. 
And, and so if we look at all of the things that are going to be used from the trader's computer right through to the trading floor and back again, we need to be able to timestamp and synchronize all the nodes. And for microsecond trading, it means nanosecond accuracy at least. And that's what the chip scale atomic clocks can do. It doesn't stop micro trading, but it enables you to timestamp so you know who did what in what order. And that's important when it comes to working out the financial consequences. So high frequency trading gives you the ability to timestamp. And also, it means that if you have GPS outage, you can still run these things with a local flywheel. Okay, right, so as I said, these things are accurate at the moment to better than 10 to the 10. Okay, we, we'll be able to get it up to 10 to the 12, I'm fairly sure. They cost about $1,500, which actually isn't that much different from the cost of one of those jammers that I was telling you about. Okay, and, and I have a feeling that these kinds of compact chip scale atomic clocks will become quite prevalent. Uh, right. So, those little cells are pretty good. Is it the end of the story? No, because we can start using cold matter. Laser-cooled atoms, laser-cooled ions, Bose condensates, and so on. And that's the big challenge for the academic community to, to, to build on that. So what we currently are worrying about within a whole raft of things here at Imperial and at NPL and, and elsewhere. So this is an NPL chip scale Iron clock, okay, it's fabricated just like a lot of these things uh, in, a, in a fab plant. Trouble is the infrastructure that's all around it is colossal. Okay, this is the, the atom version of the same thing from Ed Hines' group. This is an atom chip where cold atoms are steered across here. Okay, so there's the guiding structure. If we look at it blown up, there's a little Bose-Einstein condensate that sits above the, the wire. So that's an early chip. And uh, it gives you the ability to, to use these things in an incredibly sensitive way. Okay. Well, GPS dependencies, just to summarize, there's a whole raft of things we know about in terms of geopositioning. But the banking system, which I spent a long time telling you about, the transportation system, but also within power grids, when you need to switch power from one part to another in a complex grid. All of these things will, will, will require the kind of time stamping that I spoke of. We have a prototype experiment called Fiber Time where we're delivering atomic clock time to the trading floor at the moment. Um, and the Financial Services Agency are kind of interested. There are a range of things you can do if you can build one of these things. Now I promised to tell you a little bit more about measurement. Okay, but I, I can't help but show you this thing, which is to demonstrate how technology really moves. Um, in 1974, we needed an upgrade for the memory on the Atlas computer at the Rutherford lab. Okay? Because the price was over 400,000, we needed ministerial approval for it. Okay, I'll show you the invoice in a minute. Okay? It was a megabyte we wanted. <laughs> okay? It would have bought a street of houses in those days. Okay? Um, you can buy a terabyte from, from Amazon now uh, for under 50 pounds, okay? That's the invoice, okay? It, and, and technology has progressed incredibly well. So if I take my, my, my uh, memory stick that I've got in my bag over there, my eight gigabyte memory stick, if I translated it into the prices from 1974, would have been more than the defense budget of the UK. Okay, so things progress really well, okay? That's something I can't resist. This is brain, in, brain power. Isn't it amazing you can, you can actually give units to it? That's the number of instructions per second as against time. There are machines down here that Adrian and I can remember. Um, there's the first supercomputer I ever used, the Cray-1. I'm kind of depressed that the PlayStation is over there. Uh, <laughs> okay, so technology. So I'm predicting confidently, of course, that Moore's Law, which has led to these advances, will fail within a decade. Moore's Law has been true for five decades. In each decade, someone said, Moore's Law will fail at the end of this de decade. Okay, but I predict it will fail. I have reasons for it, of course, but I might be wrong. So let's look at some pundits. Okay, Lord Kelvin. I can, st I can state flatly that heavier than air flying machines are impossible. 
X-rays will prove to be a hoax. Radio has no future. There's a, an X-ray, by the way, of Kelvin's hand. <laughs> so I might, and I did promise this. I'll do it quick. Precise measurements to uh, the, all the various things that we know to do this. Um, I did a rough and ready analysis when I was CSA at NPL, and precise measurements cost the UK 50 billion per annum in terms of precision engineering. Right. So, some quotes on measurements. A false, a false balance. Okay, Whitworth, he of the screw. You can only make as well as you can measure. Okay, that's Kelvin. I love that one. I'll leave it for you to read. A meager and unsatisfactory kind is a great, a great phrase. But this is the one that I think is summarizing what I've been telling you. This is from Kelvin in 1870. Sorry, it's from Clark Maxwell in, in, in 1870. And what it, what it states is the beginning of what's now called the SI unit system, which is that if you want units of anything, you do it in terms of quantum things. Okay, I showed you time linked to the cesium atom. Okay, there is one that we still require an artifact for. Okay, it's the kilogram. The kilogram is a lump of stuff in a safe in Paris, outside Paris. And there are nine copies. Um, to get into the safe, the president of France has a key and, and, and the chair of BIPM has a key. And, and every, every, every little while, they take it out and they wash it because crud accumulates on the surface. We know from studies that about 50 micrograms are removed by washing every time. But that's defined as the kilogram. So the act of washing that thing makes everything else in the universe heavier. <laughs> now that's morally repugnant, which is why we need a quantum unit of mass. And that's where I'm going to end. Quantum technology has the ability to produce this exquisite precision, an exquisite pre precision that's not only exploited in science, but throughout the everyday world. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor. Um, is there any questions in the audience? You have the opportunity to ask whatever you want now, so use it wisely. <laughs> or even <laughs> unwisely. <laughs> or none. Yes. Yes, so one day, if you're a wealthy banker with a fast car and you have this clock, can you measure time dilation on this clock? Um, People measure time dilation uh, for a number of moving vehicles. Um, and at the moment, I think that you'd, you'd, you'd need either aircraft, which we, we've done, or spacecraft to do it. Um, with this kind of precision that I told you about on the iron clap, uh, trap, um, I think you'd be able to uh, measure the Doppler shifts from the speed of walking. Any other question? Right at the back. Um, in the UK, both the little ones that go into the cigar lighter and the bigger ones are legal to buy, but illegal to use. Um, and we are trying to get that modified. I'm not going to sell you one. <laughs> um, last no. question? No, all exhausted. No. Okay, so, well, thank you so much to Peter Knight. Um, We just uh, present him a gift for giving a nice talk. Oh, very so, nice. Thank you so much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.